Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Great. Okay, I never quite recognize myself in these introductions. People are so kind, don't they? But uh, I'm sure you've got the, uh, the picture that I've been around a long time and I haven't quite made up what I mind to as to what I should do. But somehow or other, throughout that, my career, well, other things I've done, I've always come back to, uh, to autism and, uh, and to, as Richard said, especially um, Asperger's syndrome. And I suppose as I got older, my concerns about autism have increasingly become uh, around what happens to people as they get older uh, with uh, autism spectrum disorder. So um, conferences like this one um, give me an opportunity to share my ideas with you and hopefully give me an opportunity to hear some of your thoughts about the subject. Uh, it's, um, it's a bit paradoxical perhaps to at a conference about Lorna to focus on her husband, uh, John, but the reason I'm doing that is because it was actually John who got me into autism. I went along for an interview at the Morsley Hospital and uh, he was very sceptical and uh, said to me, what am I interested in? I said, I was interested in non-verbal communication. So he said, oh, well, you ought to meet my wife, Lorna. She's just got very interested in that herself around something called uh, Asperger, something described by Asperger. And our conversation about autism didn't really go much further than that. Um, and it wasn't until I thought about him in connection with this lecture that I realised how much he influenced Lorna. I've been told that some of these details may be open to interpretation. I got them from the Daily Telegraph victory about John. But um, he clearly did have a strong influence over Lorna, although his main interest were, of course, in schizophrenia. Um, and in some ways, perhaps, there's a little bit of John behind the impetus for this conference. That's not to say, of course, that Lorna hasn't made an enormous contribution to uh, autism and continue to make the contributions I'm sure you've heard from previous speakers right up until her, her death, close to her death. John and uh, Lorna had a uh, daughter, Susie, who died at the age of 53. So that's germane to my discussion because one of the issues for me is what happens to people as they get older. And one of the possibilities is that people with autism might die prematurely. So I'm going to be talking about that a fair bit because actually that's obviously something we should be really seriously concerned about if that's true. And it's an odd thing that somehow we don't know. Um, so I'm going to be looking at that. One, one of the reasons I became particularly interested is that I did a study um, in Sheffield with some colleagues, Miles Balfe and Mike Campbell uh, and uh, Ting Chen, and we were looking at the prevalence of autism in the Sheffield, city of Sheffield. So we tried very hard to identify people with autism short of knocking on doors, and we didn't have the money for that, but we put posters up and we went on the radio and we put it there. And what we found was that a lot of young people were identified. Um, as you can see, that's the kind of just perhaps focus on blue line. <coughs> Maybe there's something I can find. Never mind. Um, but as their, um, the age of our sample got uh, higher, the prevalence dropped dramatically. There was a little blip around the early 30s, which I assume, probably quite irresponsibly, was when fathers came along with their children for a diagnosis to the pediatrician or the uh, child psychiatrist and said, well, you know, I'm a little bit like that. And then mum said, well, yes, actually, you're quite a lot like that. <laughs> and so they went and uh, had a you know, diagnostic assessment. But other than this blip around the early 30s, um, there, there are continuing uh, disappearance in our sample of people with uh, autism. Now, you might say, and I think you would be right, there are problems about ascertainment. One particular problem is that most of the reasons that people, the reason that most people came to, to participate in research is they were pushed, pressurized by their parents, who you, know, you will know. 
uh, parents of people with autism are extremely committed to research and have made an enormous contribution to the massive increase in research funding for that reason. So as people gradually drifted away from their families or their families, uh, their parents became infirm, um, maybe that was the reason. Um, a similar kind of picture actually came, I came across this in a recent publication from um, a follow-up or a survey of the people in touch with the, uh, the appropriate department in California, um, Department of Developmental Services, and they had a similar pattern. Their enrollment numbers dropped quite dramatically. Their peak was a bit uh, Oh, they're younger than ours, but then they disappeared. Interestingly, if you had epilepsy, which is the, this curve here, you were better known to the services in later life. Uh, so that's if you have uh, epilepsy and autism. But if you have epilepsy, uh, you remain in touch with the services. But if you have epilepsy, you pretty much the same as, uh, as with autism. So, What's happened? And of course, there are two obvious possibilities. One is that people with autism get better, uh, whatever that means. I hope you'll accept this broad brush concept of betterness in autism. I know that you know, it's, it's very judgmental and all that, but you kind of know what I mean. They just, people with autism gradually no longer see themselves as requiring to be differentiated out from everybody else from particular need of services and so on and so forth. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it is the fact that they die. Or a third possibility is that people with autism become so cut off and alienated and marginalized that they simply get lost to services. So I, I did some consultation with the Sheffield Homeless Service, for example, for a while, and there were clearly people in that who had, uh, were just existing, uh, not always ruthlessness, but uh, homeless, in a homeless state, no fixed abode, as we used to say and uh, they had autism. And in fact, their families kind of knew where they were, but they, the relationships with the family had got so bad that nobody really wanted to talk to anybody else in the family. So that's another possibility. Another issue that came up in our study very interestingly, and I thought this was so telling, is that uh, we wanted to go back and talk to some of our uh, participants again, and uh, the principally young men were willing to have us do that. But the young women um, who we'd identified said, some of them said, well, you know, I'd really like to help, but I've just got a new partner or a new friend, and I really don't want him to know that I have autism, because I know that if I, if I tell him, that will put a wedge between us and break up our relationship. So there is terrific pressure on women with autism, as it seems to me, I'm you know, open to your views, but as it seems to me, to conceal their autism because there's so much higher expectation on them. Um, men somehow seem to think that it's okay to have autism, that it's okay to be looked after by somebody in some sort of a way or another. And uh, so maybe that's a part of it, that uh, the proportion of women known to services particularly drops. Another very simple and silly explanation is that, uh, not silly, but kind of every day, is that we put up notices in libraries and GP surgeries, and we, in the papers I say, and we uh, were on the radio and stuff. So, but all of that was, were situations where people had to, know, you know, had to be using some kind of communication medium with other people. So another possibility is that people with autism, as they get older, simply become so withdrawn that they just you know, don't read the paper, they don't, uh, they don't uh, go to their GP, uh, they don't go to libraries, although, as we know, libraries are one of the safest places as far as so many people with autism go. So I wrote about this, a little bit about this in a textbook I wrote a few years ago. But at that time, there was very little evidence of four on the subject. But there's been an increasing amount of evidence now. Um, for example, this is uh, evidence about what's called age-standardized 
daddy rates. Now that's uh, basically how many years of life you lose through disability, so that's kind of a funny kind of figure. It means how much years of good quality life you use, plus how many years of life do you lose overall through premature mortality. And as you can see, I mean, it's not so important that you actually concentrate on each of these things, but as you can see, for the first time, um, autism is appearing somewhere <coughs> I can't see it because it's too close by, but somewhere on there, I'm sure somebody can see autism. There it is, over here. Now, of course, this is kind of the first time in a way people have been putting an epidemiological lens onto adults and looking at what happens to adults. But those are figures about what people know. So there, for example, the number of lives of years lost is based on people's estimates of mortality. We don't have that, those data. So, Actually, they might, the figure might be much greater. Um, and these are important figures because these are the sorts of figures that health planners have, that people who are spending money have in determining how much services to provide. In another study, again, another the first time starting to get people actually thinking about these things, people looked at the number of um, the mortality um, associated with psychiatric disorder, this is the whole list. Um, and this is where autism spectrum disorder goes. And the important thing to note here is it's about the same increased mortality is associated with smoking. So smoking has been the focus of, as we all know, an enormous uh, public uh, campaign, public health campaign, which has been largely effective and has changed the mortality from smoking or the number of deaths from it from uh, smokers. Um, so these figures about mortality, although it's a very crude measure of how good a quality a person's life is, it's just, you know, there's a lot more to life than just carrying on somehow or other till the end. Um, they're important in influencing services, attitudes, and so on. So why could, might there be an increased risk of death? Well, one possibility um, that's often mentioned is epilepsy. So if you have epilepsy in autism, something like uh, probably 20 to 25 percent of people have at least one uh, epileptic seizure in their lives uh, who have autism or Asperger's syndrome, any of the ASDs, there is an increased mortality. It was always said too that there was an association with learning disability because of the well, the increased risk of, if you have intellectual disability in autism, having some kind of congenital syndrome that would be associated possibly also with cardiac malformations and so on. So, the kind of approach up till quite recently has been, well, the, the issue is principally physical and it occurs to a, a smaller group of people who have some um, kind of associated health issues. Um, and that indeed was the situation with, uh, and there's an increased risk in women because it used to be thought that women with ASD were more likely to have physical um, disabilities, partly because women with lesser, uh, kind, lesser severity of ASD weren't being recognized. So uh, there have been several studies. One, um, one important one has been, was a follow-up of a, a well-known study of siblings in uh, Utah carried out by a uh, team in um, California and they've now followed up um, a, a proportion of their uh, cohort and they found that uh, there's substantial hazard ratio uh, hazard rate ratio or risk of dying compared to the general population, the age standardizes the same age group. And they again said, well, it was mainly about respiratory, cardiac, and epileptic events. So that was more or less the, the picture that I was saying, the kind of traditional picture. Um, it's about um, physical disorder. Of course, it's important to note that some of these things aren't necessarily about having some kind of congenital condition. They might be lifestyle. 
So you're much, much more at risk of respiratory and cardiac complications if you develop obesity. So we, it's well known that people with autism, um, in a proportion of cases, avoid contact with the public because of bullying or because of previous social exclusion. We did a little study of children who made significantly fewer steps at school uh, if they had autism because they basically paced around the classroom or the library or the corridors. They didn't go out and play because they were going to get excluded or bullied. Um, so it may be that some of these issues are about lifestyle, um, about anxiety, people treating their anxiety with uh, compulsive eating and so on. So, it can't be assumed that these are necessarily physical complications of autism. Mm -hmm. But there is a kind of suggestion that it's really about physical, predominantly medical complications. The other thing about the study is that they only followed people up to their late 30s. So it leaves open, really, what happens to people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, this is before, for example, the age group of people with Down syndrome who start to develop the peak instance of dementia. So if people hadn't followed up people with Down syndrome into their 40s and 50s, they wouldn't have spotted this very important association. So it's, it is possible there is some kind of association with um, conditions. Gilberg and, and his colleagues did a similar study um, following up a group of individuals, although this group were um, already physically handicapped in one way or another. But again, they found a higher uh, mortality rate and uh, ep epilepsy was important contributor to that, but accidents also were important contributor. So why would that be? Well, it could be about dyspraxia. It could be about uh, where other people treat you with autism, it's an open question. They also found a link with intellectual disability. This study in California um, similarly found that there was an increased uh, rate of death. It was particularly associated with uh, epilepsy in that study, so clearly that is a particular issue. But um, there are other uh, conditions that increase mortality, uh, accident again, uh, suicide, all the same. But actually the most interesting thing is cause unknown. Mm -hmm. So what does cause unknown mean? Well, cause unknown, I presume, means that somebody gets taken to the coroner and they, you know, they have a diagnosis of autism and they die, and nobody really knows how or why. So is that neglect, is it abuse, is it, you know, people have neglected health conditions? Questions so there is a kind of picture of the um, baby. This is the same study I mentioned before, but the important thing I wanted you to know here is the number of people who are lost to follow-up. So this was a very careful study. Um, and, uh, but just people just disappeared. Now, of course, people always disappear in epidemiological studies, but this was rather exceptional. Six out of 37 people who were given an aid or no longer had it. So the other thing this study found is that some people with autism do not, no longer have uh, the symptoms that would lead somebody to diagnose autism at that time. These people looked at the kinds of ways in which people might change with age. And, were given an study. and one of the things that was found is there is an improvement in repetitive and ritualistic behaviours. Now, that may, as no you probably all know, be a particular issue for children with autism who have a fear of change and uh, cling on to routines. But that's something that apparently in some people may may gradually improve. So that's a positive thing. But what doesn't improve, of course, as you would expect, are the social, the social impact of uh, Education, occupation, living situation. 
change. Now, why is that? Well, is it because the fundamental non-verbal communication thing doesn't improve? Or is it because actually, as you go through childhood and adolescence, you accumulate a number of um, dysfunctional feelings, difficulties, uh, blocks about other people, that makes it increasingly difficult for you to adapt. I see, I tend to see um, more able people, and I see sometimes doctors and sometimes lawyers, or is it because people like that? And one of the striking things is the ways in which they are very able in many ways and very conscientious and very committed to their professions, but they somehow get themselves into situations that become traps. And often those traps are motivated by their own perception that what they're doing is righteous in some way. And that idea of you know, seeking justice or seeking righteousness can be the worst possible thing. You know, when people say, I'm going to go to law, I always say, well, OK, if you want to, but don't expect justice. Because nobody comes out of a law court thinking, I've got my just deserves here. They come out frustrated. Um, but people with autism believe that the world should be constructed so you do come out feeling that justice is concerned. I hope there aren't any judges here by the way. I give my, my idle remarks about the law. So, and interestingly, there's actually less social integration, according to this study, than for people with intellectual disability. We don't maybe you'll receive the same kind of degree of social. Disappointments. Now, if this is true, of course, it does have implications for us because it means that maybe we can do more to help so, the long term adult uh, quality of life for people if we attend to some of those other issues. Uh, maybe, maybe arise from bullying or maybe arise from other things. This is one of the few studies that uh, of very long-term studies of uh, into older age of people with an interesting drug study. Um, and they, they, I haven't put the measures of quality of life that they use, but they focus particularly on quality of life. Um, and as you'd expect, there is a substantial loss or substantial diminution of life quality this is one of the few studies your own age without very long term studies. So even if the mortality issue doesn't isn't important, the quality of life issue is. Now of course many medical conditions lower the quality of life. Um, so but that's not to say one should just take that you know for granted. It's to say that one needs to identify what lowers the quality of life and attend to it in some way. <coughs> And it wasn't related to aging. They did a further study because they didn't think their meta-analysis of published data was uh, gave them the answers they were looking for. And again, they didn't find age or um, affected quality of life. And interestingly, nor did symptom severity, that's autism symptoms, or IQ. Um, so for some other factor about autism, and I think probably about social isolation, and social lack of social contact, loneliness, and so on. Putting it in a more positive way, what can we say enhances the quality of life? Now, I was very struck reading somebody who'd been asked that um, by the West Midlands Autism Association, and they said, well, it was my interest, my special interest. A lot of people thought they were a bit dark. I knew they did. Um, and I knew that they weren't, in some ways, very important to other people either. But they gave me a focus. They gave me something that made each day worth living. <coughs> they gave me a sense of achievement when I was able to find something out that bore on me that I had been searching for for a long time. Um, that's, what, that's what really made my life worthwhile. Now, that's interesting because Sometimes we try and dissuade people from getting too involved in their special interests and ask them to, to involve themselves in our interests. Um, so that was, uh, I don't know what to make of that. 
Right, so I'm, I'm going to go a bit off, um, off this scientific stuff now, and I'm going to speculate. Um, I've never really been a proper researcher, I've always been a bit of a clinician, so I'm one of those people who make a mountain out of a molehill, you know, see one person and have a whole theory about everything. So I'm going to make some sort of that kind of um, observation, and then maybe there'll be an opportunity for questions and comments from the, uh, from the audience. This is actually a, uh, a figure from a paper called uh, Critical Dipole Length of the Wetting Transition Due to Collective Water Dipole Interactions. <laughs> now, I don't suppose you came this afternoon expecting to learn about dipoles. And I don't think you will, actually, because I know very little about them at all. But what I was looking for was something that would um, characterize some, the way in which many of the people with autism I've known in middle age, admittedly a more able group typically, have found some kind of uh, emotional resolution in their lives. And that is a bit like uh, dipoles do. If, if you have, um, if they get too cramped together so that there are electrical charges that impact on the, uh, in this case, some other kind of charge particle, well, I think it's about um, mixing, then uh, everything goes wrong. There's a lot of stress and, uh, and so on. But if you stretch the dipole, in other words, if the distance between the charge, the charge of oxygen and hydrogen atoms uh, increases, then these things that are floating on it, the things that are dissolved in the water, these green things, start to smile. I, um, I once had a patient who was uh, the head of theological college, and uh, he had a lot of marital turbulence and remarried and, uh, and became very distressed. And I took the view that really he needed to have marital help. You know, I knew he had autism because I, well, unfortunately I made that diagnosis. But I thought the problem was that he needed marital help. And uh, so we, we went about it in a, I hope, an autism friendly way, looking at practical matters and so on. And then he came in one day and he said, Well, my wife and I have decided to split up. So I felt this was a terrific failure on my part. Um, I said, well, okay. And what they actually did was they had separate properties, they saw each other on specified occasions by arrangement, and they became a very stable couple. So it's like what a, <coughs> the kind of dipole had extended a bit, and somehow everything settled down because there wasn't that kind of uh, high energy emotion issue. So perhaps one of the things that about longer term social adjustment is finding a way that people can make relationships that aren't quite so emotionally pressurized and that the rest of us don't make neurotypical judgments about you know, intimacy and those sorts of things. We accept that there are different ways to have relationships and a relationship that is semi-detached might be absolutely perfect for somebody. I'm not saying that Everybody with autism is like that. I'm not saying, you know, this is how it should be, or people with autism are incapable of making intimate relationships. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying, though, that I've learned that helping people find different patterns of relationship can allow them to maintain good quality relationships in their terms, to remain socially in contact, but not to have to make this dreadful choice of being stressed up by social expectation half the time, or feeling that you have to withdraw. And of course, that applies to many other social situations, including us seeing people as professionals, you know, that we need to accept that kind of uh, slightly cool, maybe slightly detached uh, relationship. So, that's just maybe over um, extending from one person and a paper about water.
But I'd like to return to this other issue, which is about the toxicity of social relationships, of society, which I should put. I suppose many of you who've met adolescents, particularly, who say the world is a bad place, I hate the world, um, I never want to have anything to do to do with people again, the only time I'll be happy is if I'm completely on my own. And yet you know that actually those people also experience an intense degree of loneliness when they are completely on their own, and often feel that their life becomes lacks structure or lacks direction or lacks meaning. So they're having to make the same kind of invidious choice as I said people make before. They're having to somehow choose uh, between two, for them, uh, impossible poles. But the other bit of the ingredient is that often these are people who've been marginalized or victimized in some way and uh, have developed a sense that the world isn't just sort of passively toxic because it's making demands, but actively toxic. That they will be, uh, if they go on a bus, they might be attacked because they were attacked on a school bus. You know, that can still happen. Uh, if they go to somewhere where there are people interacting uh, with them, that some of those people might be aggressive. Uh, if they go to the pub, somebody might say, what are you looking at, or why don't you... You know, we know all those kinds of scenarios. So I'm currently working with a dental colleague with autism who's been explaining all of these feelings to me. And what's interesting about him is that he trained and married and had children and so on, and did fine, fine in a kind of way. But then there came a point where all this stuff, which he called stress, and says he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, kind of came back. And suddenly, uh, it impinged on him in a way that it hadn't before. It impinged on him because he, I think he felt powerless. He felt unable to, to deal with particular difficulty over his children. And then all subsequent experiences in his life have become judged by this rubric of whether they're a kind of post-traumatic stress or a trauma. <coughs> Each time he runs into a problem, and he's run into quite a few since then, he experiences this as a trauma in some way imposed on him by other people. Now, you can say, well, he, you know, he doesn't have great negotiation skills and, and so on, and he would probably admit that he doesn't. But his experience isn't that he's messing up in some way. It's not that he feels that he's not worth it or life's not worth it. He isn't suffering from de depression directly. What he's saying is that the world is a bad place and there are people who are oppressors all around him. And Every so often, despite trying to remain cheerful and collecting rare vegetables and things like that, fishing rods, the world comes back and uh, you know, gets, just gets too much for him. And then he gets into a really high state and it's you know, affected his professional career in a big way and so on. So he says the world is a bad place, but he also says I'm a champion of the oppressed. I'm standing up for the oppressed. So he's got himself into a kind of state of mind where he's not just having to suffer all these slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, but he, he has to fight against them. And of course, the more he fights against them, the more he finds people who uh, fight against him. And then he gets very focused on the past. Every new thing reminds him of the past. And he tells himself that he owes it to himself to pay people back, even if he, in his case, runs the risk of uh, losing his life. So, to come back to our theme, what happens to people who get older? Some people, I think, do find ways to uh, find a quality of life perhaps because they become, their symptoms improve, perhaps because uh, there are various niches that open up in the adult life which they build to great effect. And partly, maybe, that has to do with being able to make use of your special interests 
and somebody has encouraged you. But I think we make a bit too much of special interests because actually, you know, at the end of the day, all of us have our dreams based on some interest or other as children, but very few of us get to realize them. So it's not just special interests, it's something that goes right. And that's great, and that's maybe why some of them don't identify as having autism as they get older, which is, you know, fine, brilliant. Some are under pressure not to identify themselves as having autism because of social rejection, and I think women are a particular risk of that because of the high demands that men place on women and the expectation that women will be empathizers so they can be as systematic as they like. Um, but then there are a portion of people who die, who see, and uh, maybe a proportion of people who have some associated congenital condition who suffer from <coughs> heart murmur or valvular disease. But the ones that I trouble me, because I think it's in a way preventable, are those who just disappear. And I know I've seen some who disappear because they become fail to cope with the adult world once a parent dies. I know that's the nightmare of many parents. But others disappear because they feel that they're fighting against a world that rejects them, and they either get into a constant fight, which leads them eventually to give up, I think, or they simply withdraw and give up and say, um, it's all hostile out there. Perhaps the extreme example of that is a guy I met who spent six hours by the kitchen sink because that was the only place he could really feel safe in the world. He could manage his bedroom on a good day for an hour or two. He could almost never go out, um, but the kitchen sink was fine, so he'd stay or stand by the kitchen sink. And that seems to me not a, a, a problem with autism in itself, it seems to me a problem about the trajectory that people find themselves getting into as children or adolescents with autism that then somehow locks them in as they get older. Now I'm not saying I share this view that the world is a bad place. We all know it can be, but you know, sometimes we're bad too and sometimes the world's a really good place. So I'm not saying it's down to, you know, we should, us neurotypicals are horrid. Um, but what I am saying is that somehow there is a complex emotional development that affects most people with autism, probably people with intellectual disability too, and somehow we haven't really understood the implications of that for lifelong development. Recent studies have shown that people at 50 have an increased risk of depression if they've been bullied in adolescence, for example. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I'm a Freudian, you know, I believe that everything's done and dusted in the first six months of life or it's our internal objects or anything of that sort. But I suppose what I am saying is maybe the emotional development uh, of people with autism, their sense in which they can trust other people or not trust other people, in which other people will try and trust or meet them in some place, has a very long-term effect potentially, I think. But of course, this is speculation because we still really don't know enough about people with autism as they get older. And the majority of those people we now know, or at least 50% of them will be people without intellectual disability, who have uh, fewer incapacitating symptoms as symptoms um, than the people we used to think of as autistic. So this is a group of people we sometimes call group a good prognosis group, but yet I don't think they have a good prognosis particularly uh, because of something that goes wrong with emotional development. I'm very much looking forward to, in the future, us understanding these processes better and knowing when and how to intervene. Thank you very much for your attention.